Thank you for attending today. I appreciate all of you here. Uh, appreciate all of you able to be here and those of you joining us on the phone. We are recording this, uh, so that anyone could, who couldn't make it today will be able to view it on our website later. I'm Thomas Pristo. I'm the Director of Health and Human Services and also the Chief Health Officer. I'd like to acknowledge um, County Manager Jimmy Jane and Supervisor Babbitt is here. Thank you both for attending. We're here today to discuss the outbreak of the respiratory illness caused by COVID-19. There's been a great deal of news coverage on this situation. We feel it is important to have a conversation with our community partners to ensure you have the most current and accurate information. Outbreaks of virus infections among people are always a public health concern. The risks to the general public from these outbreaks depend on characteristics of the virus, including how well it spreads between people, the severity of the resulting illness and the medical or other measures available to control the impact of the virus, such as vaccines or medications that can treat the illness. This is a rapidly evolving situation and the complete clinical picture with regard to COVID-19 is not really fully known. The illness has shown sustained person-to-person -person transmission in several geographic locations and illnesses have ranged from mild symptoms to very severe symptoms. <clears throat> Although the immediate risk of COVID-19 infection to people in the United States and Coconino County is still believed to be relatively low, it's important to note the current global circumstances suggest it is likely that the virus will continue to spread. As community spread is detected in more and more locations, the need for local preparedness is emphasized. You may have heard the media and many health professionals say it is not a matter of if, but when the illness will reach communities throughout the United States. Most cases of COVID-19 are likely to be identified in the upcoming days, including most cases in the United States. It's also likely that sustained person-to-person -person spread will continue to occur, including throughout the communities in the United States. It's likely that at some point, widespread transmission, transmission of COVID-19 in, in the U.S. will occur. This highlights the importance of all aspects of our community being prepared. I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Marie Peoples now uh, for her opening remarks, and then we will get on to our uh, uh, discussion of COVID-19. Dr. Peoples. Thank you, Mr. Bristow. Good morning, everyone. As Thomas said, Dr. Marie Peoples, Deputy County Manager of our Health, Human Services, and Criminal Justice. And it's really my pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, as you guys know, I see so many friendly faces. Good morning. As you guys know, this meeting has been long planned, and this shows the nature of uh, healthcare and how things pivot. And so we appreciate having that pivot and taking it with us and being part of it. Uh, we have the right people in this room, in this group, to be able to discuss this and how uh, to discuss COVID-19 and how things have changed. A few things that I want to share, um, as you guys know, the disease um, or illness continues to evolve and we'll have to be agile as we address it and plans may change and so having great communication structures in place is going to continue to be important so we can disseminate that information quickly in terms of how things have changed because it will change um, and as they always do with novel diseases. One of the things that I want to share is what uh, Coconino County is doing in terms of preparation. So we are of course taking this incredibly seriously in terms of being able to prepare for not only our community but our staff. We're looking at what we're doing in terms of supporting staff and to be able to support their families, looking at how we're managing sick time, looking at how um, we're working with our community members in terms of that so that we can continue to be a leader in this space and have policies in place or protocols in place as things continue to arise. Uh, we also have emergency emergency declarations prepared in case the county um, does eventually see cases and how we would stand up operations and do things in that event. So we're doing many of those things and if there's documents or items that we can share with other jurisdictions we continue to be partners and we're happy to share those and we would ask the same in return as we continue to go through this and that we're all a resource for each other. And with that we'll go ahead and get started and I'll turn it over but again thank you everybody for being here. Mr. Christo. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Peoples. I'd like to introduce uh, Matt Mauer, Matt Mauer, who's our uh, epidemiologist for Health and Human Services, and Ben Wilson, who is our uh, emergency management PFAP um, manager. So, folks. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for showing up. Awesome to see so many community partners <laughs> here right now uh, for, as what was uh, already discussed, is this rapidly evolving situation. 
what we're going to uh, do today uh, to get everybody on the same page. A lot of you may be super familiar with uh, the situation. Uh, some may not be as familiar with the situation. Uh, so I'm going to go over an update and a situation summary uh, to start off with. Uh, and then uh, we'll go into a little bit more about the response. Uh, many of you have been receiving updates from myself and we've been in lots of communication. So for some of you, I hope this is review. So let's get started off with the coronavirus overview in general so everybody can get on the same page with what is this illness. Uh, this is a large family of viruses that are common in many different species. Uh, including, most of them are animals. Cattle, cats, bats. Uh, most coronaviruses infect animals. On rare occasions, these coronaviruses can evolve and infect humans and then start to spread between humans. That's what we're concerned with as far as this COVID-19 goes. For COVID-19, we saw one instance where this virus evolved went from infecting human re uh, animal reservoirs, one instance where it then infected humans, and now we're concerned about that human-to-human -human transmission with this COVID-19. Human coroma, cor coronaviruses commonly cause mild to moderate illness in people worldwide. What I wanna do is I wanna go over uh, two previous coronavirus uh, outbreaks that we saw uh, globally to get up to not give, help give us an understanding of this COVID-19. First is SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. This was a coronavirus. This was first reported in 2003. The illness spread to more than two dozen countries in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, before SARS became a global outbreak. And then in 2003 is when it was contained. Symptoms associated with this coronavirus, the SARS coronavirus, Fever, headache, body aches, respiratory illnesses, dry cough. Transmission, close person-to-person -person contact through respiratory droplets. That should sound familiar for COVID-19. According to the World Health Organization, a total of around 8,000 people worldwide became sick with the severe acute respiratory syndrome during that 2003 outbreak. Of these, 774 died. It was about a 10 to 12% fatality rate <coughs> behind that. In the United States, only eight people had laboratory evidence of this SARS coronavirus infection. All of these people had traveled to other parts of the world where SARS was spreading. <coughs> I'd also like to go over MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. For this one, it occurred uh, in 2012 and into 2000, and into 2000 uh, uh, end of 2012. Uh, health officials first alerted, were alerted of this disease due to cases due in Saudi Arabia in September of 2012. Most people infected either lived in the Arabian Peninsula or recently traveled from the Arabian Peninsula before they became ill. Symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath. Those symptoms should sound familiar. Transmission, close person, person contact through respiratory droplets. Source was, for this one was believed to be from camels and we still see uh, transmission from camels to humans uh, within that Arabian Peninsula for Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, worldwide, there were about, only about 3,000 cases, confirmed cases of MERS, and with that, 858 deaths. This one had about a 35% fatality rate. Just wanted to give some background into other coronaviruses that we have seen within this millennium. So let's get into the 2019 novel coronavirus. Uh, the virus itself, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is a name for this uh, virus uh, because, of its, uh, because of its relationship uh, genetically to that SARS. The disease name we're referring to as COVID-19. You'll hear me refer to it as COVID-19. As an overview, this illness uh, was first identified within Wuhan, China, which is in the Hubei province. The first couple hundred cases were all uh, identified to have an association with a market that was within Wuhan city. This market was a, a, a live animal and large seafood market. These initial cases all had an association of going to that market. Later on, as cases started to increase and increase and increase, 
that's when we realized that there was human to human transmission with this COVID-19. We're still working on understanding a lot about this virus and how it acts, how it infects people. We have previous coronaviruses to go off of, uh, but research is currently being done from the cases that we are seeing, from the, the, the illness that is being experienced in people, to work on identifying the specifics behind how this disease, the symptoms behind it, the transmission behind it, are our capabilities for testing and identifying this disease. Uh, our symptoms associated with COVID-19, this novel coronavirus, fever, particularly fever, cough, and shortness of breath. So we're looking for the symptoms, we're looking for that fever and or our respiratory symptoms of cough or difficulty breathing. These symptoms, the incubation period, meaning from the time that you are infected up until the time that you start to show symptoms is anywhere from about two to 14 days. And there's research coming out about that. Uh, I, I read an article, I read a study last night uh, showing an average of about 5.1 days. Uh, only about 2% of people had less than two days and 97% of people are showing less than 11 days. So this two to 14 is showing to be uh, a very accurate description. Uh, CDC, uh, transmission, person to person spread through contact with respiratory droplets is the main way that uh, we are identifying transmission of this illness. CDC has developed a test to identify the, the virus within patient specimens. These tests are now out within state health departments and commercial laboratories as well uh, this week ha uh, have the capabilities uh, to perform tested for testing for COVID-19 as well. As I said, the original cases were linked to that uh, large seafood and, and live animal market in, in Wuhan, uh, China. However, the exact source has still not yet been identified and is still under investigation. All right, so let's go on to a uh, situation summary of where we stand right now. Within Coconino County, we have zero uh, confirmed cases at this moment. Uh, we have one negative test, and we have one pending test that we are supposed to get results for today. Within Arizona, we're looking at a, a total, and, and I uh, didn't get to, these numbers are constantly changed, so I'm gonna give you numbers based on what we saw from yesterday. I could pull it up online and I might see a different picture. However, I have not been given any information that we have another confirmed case within Arizona at this point. Six cases within Arizona, two of those are Maricopa County residents, three are Pinal County residents, and one Pima County resident, one of our most recent case. Total tested within, from Arizona residents, 84 people, pending tests at the Arizona State Public Health Laboratory, is what that stands for, is 27. I'll give you an idea of some recent US figures. Uh, what this is really nice to know is what is happening around the country as this situation continues to evolve. Uh, so as of yesterday, 647 confirmed cases. The majority of the clusters that we're seeing within the US are within Washington, New York, and California. Those are the clusters we're seeing. Those are the, the areas uh, where we are working on determining if there is uh, transmission happening amongst the community. Total deaths out of that are 25 within the US and 36 different jurisdictions are reporting confirmed cases, including the District of Columbia. Recent figures out of China, the reason I wanna bring this up is because we are seeing an amazing decrease in the number of new cases every day within China. There was only 45, uh, the previous uh, two or three days, there was only 45 new cases from one day to the next. That's amazing. They've been upwards of 5,000 new cases in one day. So we're starting to see a decrease in China. We're starting to see an increase uh, globally in other parts of the world. Which is this bottom point here, outside of, uh, of China, global figures, including the US, we're looking at 
uh, just above uh, somewhere between uh, 28 to, to 29,000 cases worldwide. Uh, of that, 4,000 new cases in a day. So like I said, we're starting to see more transmission globally outside of China. 686 deaths. The, the main areas around the world where we are seeing that community transmission and widespread transmission within countries is South Korea, Italy, Iran, uh, and, and some European countries as well, such as France and Germany. Uh, so let's get into the response just a little bit. The national response, the CDC, Health and Human Services, have been on top of this, this changing situation, really delivering a lot of guidance to state and, and local and tribal uh, uh, partners throughout this and updating as best they can as we identify more information uh, and we start to gain a better understanding of this illness, disease. Travel restrictions and health advisories are in place. They're monitoring cases within the U US. As I said, they're pro providing updates and guidance for us. Uh, they're giving briefings once or twice a week. They're providing briefings. Uh, to keep everybody within the, the public as well as local partners up to date on the situation. Uh, and then we also have travel advisories uh, uh, and travel restrictions in place as well. Currently those travel restrictions apply to China and Iran. The Arizona Department of Health Services uh, is also uh, in the midst of their response. Uh, when we got that first case in Maricopa County, they stood up their emergency operations center as a way to uh, combine, collaborate efforts uh, and really get all the information out uh, to people who need it. They're updating healthcare messaging with prevention and containment strategies. They're hosting all county calls for all of us to uh, be involved with each other and identify uh, what is happening amongst uh, the communities within Arizona. They're assisting counties with determining uh, suspect cases, which we refer to as PUIs, a person under investigation, is someone who we see that fits criteria for this illness, which is mainly those associated symptoms, as I mentioned, fever and respiratory symptom, symptoms, such as cough and shortness of breath. And then the main criteria that we're looking at is travel to an area with widespread transmission or those that have come in contact uh, of, of an individual that's a confirmed case of COVID-19. At this point, with the risk of, of transmission uh, being where it at, is at in the US, those are the, those are the main aspects we're looking for, the main criteria we're looking for to identify cases of COVID-19. Uh, they're also providing numerous public resources, hosting webinars to really make sure that providers, EMS, schools, universities, and community and business partners such as yourselves are up to date. Uh, and we have gotten on board with that as well, getting that information out to those who need it and providing uh, a, a group meetings such as this one to make sure our community understands what is happening, what our response is, and we are prepared uh, to, uh, to respond to COVID-19. At this point, uh, I'm gonna let our emergency preparedness uh, coordinator, Benjamin Wilson, uh, uh, continue on with this presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, as Matt was kind of talking about, we've kind of led up to the point where we're talking about what we've done, what the feds have done, what the state has done. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've done, <laughs> essentially. Um, back in late January, we realized, uh, it, let me kind of give you just a flavor for what we do here. Uh, public health emergency preparedness, we, kind of, we have a team. We keep an eye on things that are going on, and when something comes up and we decide, you know what, there might be something to this, we want to keep our finger on the pulse of these things um, so that way we can you know, be prepared and scale up as necessary. And that's one of the most important things that we need to be prepared to do is to, one, be prepared and scale up as necessary. So uh, back in late January, when this kind of started unfolding, that's exactly what we decided to do. We uh, set up an incident command team uh, because we wanted a guide to uh, have a guided response, a controlled and measured response 
to something that potentially would impact our community. Um, and so that's what we're, we did here. We established an incident uh, command team. So the incident command team consists of several different partners within uh, Health and Human Services. So epidemiology, our communicable disease uh, team, uh, our public health emergency preparedness, our public information officers, uh, finance helps us with that, and those are all part of the Health and Human Service team to do that. We have several different operations. I'm going to tie into operations, but when we first started this back in late January, we identified that we needed to be on top of our messaging. We need to be on top of our surveillance, on top of uh, monitoring, any type of communicable disease investigation, um, specimen collection and transport to the state laboratory. Um, and then we also thought, you know, we have to think a little bit uh, into the future. What happens if this gets to the point where we are supporting patients in their home or supporting healthcare uh, uh, organizations and partners? And so that's where we started with this. Since then, it's kind of revised a little bit, as Matt talked about, uh, and as everybody has talked about. Um, this uh, situation is unfolding. We don't know what it's going to look like tomorrow or next week. So it's our hand, like I said, keep, we're, we're trying to keep our hand on the pulse of this so we can stay in front of it as best as we can. Um, so our objectives have kind of evolved a little bit. Is that good? I'm sorry. So our objectives are to identify cases, isolate the sick, quarantine the exposed, and protect our vulnerable populations. It's critical. Next, we want to provide information to the public, our media, public health network, county staff, uh, to increase public awareness, address misinformation, and protect the public and increase our overall community resiliency. We want to prepare for widespread transmission in Coconino County if it occurs. Since those original objectives kind of expanded a little bit, we've kind of prepared by expanding our team somewhat. So now operational teams. Uh, the county's prepared to scale up those operations through improved monitoring in collaboration with our healthcare partners, establishing a joint information center to manage communication surge and public messaging, patient support strategies, collaborating with healthcare organizations and providers and the county making sure those relationships are tight and that we are working together uh, in this response. Enhanced and active surveillance and communicable disease investigation. So that's Matt's world here and his communicable disease team. Um, they do a really great job of that and stand on top of that. They work with our partners continuously every day to do just that. And that's a, a very important part of what we do. Um, on top of that, we have our future planning group. So for example, we work with emergency management staff to talk to them and say, okay, if this scales up, what's next? Is it an emergency declaration? Or what, what are the next steps to get to um, if we have to scale these operations up, if we really get an impact in this community? Another vital thing that we're working on is improving our coordination assistance for timely laboratory results. And that means getting uh, specimens and the right mediums to the right people and getting them down to the labs and, and then working and communicating with those people at the lab to get the information we need here and, and so forth and making sure that we use that information effectively. Another uh, need that we've identified is we potentially will have, we already are receiving a communication surge. So uh, having a call center is going to be important if we get impacted. So headed by our public affairs team, they're working to you know, put together a strategy to train staff uh, and also volunteers to take calls from the public. And our operational staff. Okay, so operational support staff, that is our, the staff that we're identifying for future operations as needed. So essentially, we have our staff that are go have ongoing operations. Um, we're re reaching out to other people who may be able to help us in future operations. Um, in ICS land, that's kind of like your staging area. We have people that we've identified that are kind of read into the, um, the plan, and that way if we need to pull people or, or additional staff, they're prepared. So what can we do as a community? Uh, one of the major things we're trying to do is enhance our collaboration with community partners to ensure accurate and timely information makes it out to the, excuse me, to the entire community. 
That's critical. So we are collaborating with many different organizations to provide that accurate and timely information to guide our response. We're establishing liaisons to improve, and, uh, improve the back and forth communication that is necessary for the people in this room, throughout the community, throughout the county, to address and make, make sure our response is as effective as it can be. We are addressing communication gaps. This is a, a step in that direction. We realize that there are gaps uh, and we're doing everything we can to make sure that that is mitigated to the greatest extent possible. Uh, to do that, we are basically so we are putting together some liaisons to manage the flow of information out to these collaborator distribution groups, which we have identified. Matt, can you talk about that for a moment? Yeah, great. So, after, at the end of last week, really identifying the need for every single person in our community to get good, accurate, high quality information about what is happening, not only uh, in the country or the state, but especially within Coconino County, when it comes to how you can be prepared and how uh, you as a community, and especially community leaders, are going to respond to the potential uh, uh, case of a COVID-19. In doing so, uh, I wanna go back to that first objective. Following the World Health Organization and what the CDC has identified as the best strategies to contain this COVID-19, we need to identify cases. Through identification of cases is how we can really contain this illness. And we're working, there's lots of, of uh, healthcare facilities in this room right now. We're working very closely uh, with those individuals, lots of them, hospitals throughout the, throughout the county. To see many of those faces here today. Clinics, anyone who provides patient care to get them the, the information they need for identification of cases. So that way we can understand who is being affected within our community. And isolating the sick, quarantining those exposed, and protecting our vulnerable populations. So with that, well, we are establishing uh, communication, both communication from our community organizations, and uh, you're gonna fit into one of these areas and then communication too, as well, to give you real accurate information about what you need to do if there is a case at your organization or what you need to do to prepare prior to there being a case at your organization. And we're gonna work very closely. There's lots of good information and we're gonna work on making sure that that information is at your fingertips for responding to a potential case of COVID-19 and the public health interventions and the community interventions that are gonna take place both prior to, during, and after any cases of COVID-19. Thank you, Matt. So enhancing our communication strategies obviously is a very important to us to ensure that we are, our messaging reaches the entire community. Um, one of the ways we did that, I'm kind of rehashing some of the things that Matt's already talked about. We established a community website. Uh, the website's up here. Uh, but thank you for the team that kind of helped put that together. That's been a great help. Um, but another thing we were also talking about is d activating a joint information center. Um, and so the public affairs teams and the public information officers to make sure that we are there, they can assist in that process of getting that information out to the public. There are many resources available. Uh, Matt was mentioning that, and it's critical for us to, we're, we're identifying those specific people that can reach out to those communities or those different segments of the population and pulling in partners to in, uh, empower that communication back and forth. So here are some things that we want to talk about. This is guide, there are gui there's guidance from the CDC and from the ADHS on how we can basically address, the, these are community-based interventions that we can take and are categorized in our three categories. So there's personal protective measures that we can do, there's community measures, and there's also environmental measures. So for example, our personal protective measures. 
Voluntary home isolation. If you're coming from an area and you think you might have been exposed, some people might be doing that. Or, or maybe we advise them to uh, isolate at, at your home. Or, home, or if maybe you've just been exposed, you don't know that you've been exposed, but maybe you think that you might be. There's also potential for a voluntary home quarantine. Um, community measures aimed at increasing social distancing. That is an important concept that we want to push out there. It, it could range from anything from just personal social distancing, uh, school dismissals, social distancing uh, in a workplace, uh, or postponing and canceling events if necessary as things scale up. Right now, we're, what we're at, we're, we're pretty good, but if things were to scale up, we want to throw a hat in those conversations. And environmental measures. What can we do in our workplace? Just cleaning off routine cleaning, the keypads that we have to get into our, our offices, um, or to have hand sanitizer available for our people and our staff. Those are important. So as Matt mentioned again, I'll just try to reiterate, the public health outbreak containment is, is critical that we identify cases, we isolate the ill, we quarantine our exposed, and we protect the vulnerable populations. Um, and those measures that we just talked about that the CDC and the ADHS put out there, we, will, we support those strategies. And again, just to kind of go over that, that's what can you do as, as a, a, personal, at a personal level to protect yourself? What can we do as a community and at your workplace to protect your staff and those around you? And environmental measures that kind of affect everybody. So the, uh, what are we doing now to kind of prepare? What are we doing? The incident command team is preparing to expand. So if we decide to go into an EOC activation, we're prepared to do that. Uh, as mentioned, the Joint Information Center is getting prepped. We might pull in a logistics section chief as resource requirements uh, or resource requests start coming in. And that, uh, uh, that critical communication uh, piece with our external partners and internal communication is going to be enhanced uh, with our liaison officers. We're reviewing our non-pharmaceutical intervention plans. We're assisting and working with community partners to talk about their own isolation and quarantine plans, social distancing policies, and the public messaging. And we want to encourage people to reach to, out to the, uh, to the county to do just that. We're working with local health care partners, and that's a big one. Um, our epidemiology uh, and our community disease staff are always working continuously with these health care organizations. Um, but so is public health emergency preparedness, and it's, there's always a back and forth with this. We want to develop mitigation strategies uh, if there are resource shortages, if there is a community surge. We want to be prepared to scale up our operations. Um, we are prepared even further if it really got to the point where we needed to pull in state and federal resources to do just that. Uh, one of the components that we have up there is the strategic national stockpile and medical countermeasures. Uh, so the, the SNS uh, stockpile is uh, our federal assets, and there's a process to get there. Uh, you know, is there's probably emergency declaration. We'll be working with the state; they would probably declare, and then they're going to reach out to the feds if we ever needed to pull in federal assets. So a lot of these organizations, cities, and, and states that have declared emergencies, those are those checks in the boxes that they have to do to get to these assets if they need them. If they don't go through those steps, they don't. Have, they, they're limiting their ability to get those resources. Um, the county's been developing comp uh, a comprehensive distribution strategy over the last year. Um, mostly we've been working with a lot, reaching out with a, a lot of different partners throughout the county. Um, but we've developed receipt stage and store capabilities locally. So public health, I'm sorry, the public works uh, team for the county is our primary uh, RSS site. But we're also working with uh, other uh, partners as an alternate site. We've developed transportation and distribution strategies and mutual aid agreements to go along with those strategies. So essentially, if we need to activate the federal resources from the strategic national stockpile, we have a strategy to reach out to activate these partnerships, uh, which are technically called, considered closed point of dispensing partners. And we're gonna activate these sites and they're all over the place. And we, we're working on not only identifying them, having MOA and mutual aid agreements with them, but also getting them trained, scaled up, so they understand um, how to do these operations. Um, I think last, my, when I got here last year, we had like three old agreements, and now we've 
quadrupled that number of, of agreements that we have in place. Uh, we, we last, I think the day before yesterday, we had about 15 trained staff. Today, we just, you know, yesterday we had a, a significant drill and exercise that probably doubled that number. And today we have more pod training that's going on in Flagstaff for our partners. And, and then tomorrow we're going up to Page and we have more partnerships. Um, so we're working to get people trained. And so it's not just talking about doing these things, it's developing those relationships. Um, so I just want to say that to let you know that as this scales up, we're prepared. We're not gonna get caught off, uh, off foot. Um, and we're reaching out to healthcare partners to collaboratively make their plans. I want to uh, reiterate that, that we are really trying to make sure that we are talking to our health organizations to discuss their capacity to admit and treat patients for COVID-19, identify resources by surveying those organizations. So we have, a, again, keeping our finger on the pulse, what do you have, what do you need? So what can your organizations do? Utilize existing resources. One of the biggest things that we do, we've realized is that we push a lot of information out to people, but we still get a lot of the same feedback from those people saying, what should we do? So it'd be great if you can kind of work towards educating yourself. We have those resources at your fingertips as Matt was talking about. We would love if you guys can kind of get out there and get to know that material yourself. And if, but if something's not clear, feel free to reach out and let us help. Communicate with the county as your organization develops your own policy and procedures. What are the triggers for active act activation? And that's something that needs to be addressed also. It's important for us to plan and prepare, but we have to remember, this is not like a, a wildfire where there's a fire break and if it breaks that, we're going to move into action. Every organization, every population is gonna vary. It's gonna be different. Circumstances are gonna be uh, dependent on a lot of different circumstances. So we need to be prepared to talk, talk about the reality of the situations um, and reach out and ask for help if necessary. Also, please review and evaluate your business and your operations. That's an important point of as well. What can you do differently to operate more safely if this gets into the community? Um, a lot of people are talking about telework options. Um, encouraging your staff to stay home when they're sick, that's critical. You know, uh, having those uh, policies in place and, and talking to them and saying, hey, you know what, you don't have to come in if you're sick. It's better if you stay home. Um, changing service delivery options for our businesses. And it's always good to dust off the continuity of operations plan. Um, consider modified staffing options and things of that nature as it becomes necessary. Please communicate with the county as your organization develops policy and procedures. And if you guys want to talk about you know, closing your business or closing a school, we want to encourage communication on this end. Please reach out to us. We want to, to help you make those decisions. Um, incorporate environmental control measures. If you're not sure about the communication, if there's a gap, we've already heard a little bit today, so I haven't heard anything about this meeting. We want to know that so we can uh, reach out and enhance that communication. But more importantly, we also want to understand your needs too. So as you as an organization have a need that's addressed, push it our way so we can help you address those needs. And communicate our, uh, with organizations to ensure they understand or are comfortable with response strategies. All right, uh, I'll, you want me to go over this? Yeah. Okay, so everybody, I'm gonna hand it back off the mat. Thank you very much. So, some of, the, some of the meat behind this and, and where we're actually at in Coconino County. Uh, Arizona, fo following uh, uh, Centers for Disease Control, uh, the, the guidance, ADHS guidance on risk level uh, is, is where we're at right now. The state of Arizona, as far as community transmission of this illness, is low currently. We are, we are not seeing transmission in our communities. And so based on that, uh, what we are advising, we're advising uh, sick people, ill people, anybody experiencing symptoms to contact their healthcare professionals and have a discussion about the illness with that healthcare professional. They can call us as well, they can call the, the Health and Human uh, Services and we're having lots of discussion with people as well. We're advising that uh, people who fit criteria for a PUI, for a person under investigation, it meets criteria for testing. 
works with a healthcare provider to get that, those specimens collected so that way we can get them tested. For people who do not meet that criteria but are sick, at this current moment, we're advising social distancing with those individuals until symptoms resolve. Social distancing, staying away from social events as best as you can. As far as social events, because of that risk of community transmission is low, we are in contact with coordinators of events. Anybody who has an event going on, we can have that discussion and we're doing it on a case-by-case -case basis. In Coconino County, we're not canceling events at this time. It is, it is not necessary due to the lack of community transmission. That may change very soon. That could change tomorrow based on our cases. But this is the guidance coming out from the state as well as the CDC to assess your level of risk for widespread transmission and your public health interventions based on that. But we need the community to be prepared. We're not advising school closures at this moment. If we get cases at a school, we're gonna work with you to develop how can we prevent, how can we contain that spread? We want people to start developing those ideas right now and we're going to assist with that process. But at this point, we are not advising it until we actually see transmission. That social distancing for the ill as well as our highly vulnerable population, those that are 60 and older. That's who we are advising social distancing for and to be prepared with what you need if you do need to quarantine for 14 days or even longer. The CDC recent, recently, uh, as of yesterday, uh, discussed for the, the elderly population, those 60 and older, to be prepared uh, with what they need for a long period of time, months, even up to a year. It's a very hard to prepare for a year, but just having that in their heads. And so discussing that uh, risk for potential spread uh, and really uh, what does that look like and what will our interventions as we get community spread, we, we will intervene and have to start closing down and canceling events, but we are not at that level right now. Here's the basics, here's what you always hear about preventing the spread of disease, and these are identified to work. Where we have seen transmission of COVID-19, these work. Stay home when you're sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Why? Because that's where transmission happens. Avoid close contact with sick people. That one's pretty self-explanatory, right? Clean and disinfect, disinfect frequently touched <coughs> objects and surfaces. Use regular household cleaning spray or wipe. We have uh, advice for COVID-19. Looking at bleach solutions, not mega bleach solutions. Your normal 10% one part bleach to nine parts water. We don't need a whole jug going onto surfaces. It's your standard. And then any sanitizers that on uh, those wipes will say effective against uh, uh, viruses, coronaviruses uh, included. How long can this virus survive on surfaces? We're currently doing that research. It is not well understood. Viruses in general are fairly wimpy surviving on surfaces. This one resembles SARS. Uh, uh, SARS, when they did the research on that, was nine minutes to in a laboratory a couple days, but that's in a laboratory setting. First COVID-19, we still do not have evidence of how well it can survive on surfaces, so we're advising cleaning. Cover your cough. Avoid that close contact with people right now. That is a recommendation uh, uh, coming out of the CDC state and across the, the globe as far as uh, what type of contact we should have with each other. Should we be shaking hands? All right? Should we be having that close contact? For now, most likely not. Elbows. So I can cough on my elbow and then... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and washing our hands. Soap and water is the best. If we're not able to have soap and water, the CDC still recommends that a 60% uh, or greater of hand sanitizer uh, is a next best case scenario. Let's plan ahead, let's be ready, let's be ready for widespread transmission, that's why we're having this today. Let's continue these uh, discussions, and not only discussions, but let's have some action behind it. I talked about the cleaning uh, for individual level, get household ready. Uh, uh, I don't think you're gonna find any toilet paper anywhere, but maybe you can order it online.
uh, FAQs are, are being developed. We're constantly working. I spend most of my day identifying what's the latest and greatest information and trying to get that information out to those who need it. And then if someone is sick in your home, we're gonna work on isolating the ill. We're quarantining those that are exposed. So what does that look like for you in your household and at your community organizations? You know your place is best. Understand the recommendations and prepare for them. That's what, what we have for you today. So this what I have. We are about ready for your questions. Uh, I want to introduce the other two members of the panel up here. Uh, Blake Scott, uh, he's our uh, Public Health Emergency Preparedness Planner, and Trish Lees, Community Relations Manager. Um, I would also like to point out um, Eric Peterson. He's our Covino County Public Affairs Director, and also Matt Ruddick in the back is our Public Information Officer, uh, is also here today. So we are ready for your questions, please. Yes. Hi, I'm from Covino Police College. And, uh, we have a uh, command team, and they're working with the county and getting us great information and sharing it with our community. And the other thing, when I go back to campus, this morning, so we can see how it takes up the information. I get a question about why I saw the news that night in the morning that they were going to go to the office, but why do you think? I do to share with these folks? Does that mean, is a thousand reported, but they haven't been confirmed yet by the CDC? Is, it, is that how I answer that? Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, surrounding this COVID-19, there's a lot of misinformation. Yes. There's a lot of information uh, going around about uh, what is a case and, and what is not a case. Uh, the CDC, those numbers that you saw, those are numbers that are identified through our public health surveillance systems within the United States. Do, those do not include individuals that have been repatriated back to the United States. Uh, that number that I have up there, uh, it may not be the number that is on the CDC website as of right now either. But that is where we can get our most accurate information regarding uh, how many cases have been identified. Now, that number itself, all in itself, is not necessarily accurate either because now that states are doing their own testing, That's what I they're having a difficult time updating, but it is it is going to be relatively close, especially if you check when you check it in the morning. They're going to be able to have all those cases from the states that came in the day before. But the CDC and Dr. Messonnier, who's doing our telebriefings, uh, has let us know that now that states are doing their own testing, it's that communication line. They're doing the best they can, uh, and we are getting briefs. We are getting news briefings on cases that come out, particularly within Arizona. Uh, to make sure that we have that accurate information. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, Ross with Flagstaff Shelter Services. We have approximately 150 to 200 uh, individuals coming through our doors each day between shelter and our day services. And um, so I guess I have sort of two questions. Well, I have a lot of questions, but uh, one, um, some of the, um, the tactics uh, don't necessarily apply when you don't have a home um, or when you don't have your own home to quarantine in and that, in that kind of thing. Um, so I have concerns about um, operationally some policy, and maybe we can talk about that when it's not just so specific to one agency, although I think there are probably group homes and that kind of thing that have questions about that. But um, my second is a lot of the things that we're hearing are around hand sanitizer and masks and gloves and that kind of thing. And at this point, those things are, feel almost impossible to get your hands on. Um, maybe not necessarily hand sanitizer, but uh, the gloves and the masks. Um, so if we're gonna be quarantining or separating sick and that kind of thing, especially with a significant number of vulnerable seniors, that kind of thing, um, is there, are there things that the county can do to help us uh, get our hands on those kind of materials? And what would your recommendations be? Great, thank you. Very difficult population that you serve. Definitely. Uh, one, of the, one of the toughest as far as people moving in and out. Uh, we're gonna have to have a deeper discussion uh, to determine 
the level of, of the capabilities when and if we do see transmission in our communities or as people are even moving around from different communities and your ability to continue operating the way you're operating right now is not going to work. It's not going to work once we see widespread transmission unless you want everybody in your shelter to get sick. Well, so we're going to have to make those is, changes. You know, partially hearing things like, well, you might have to close or you might, I mean, those are things that from a staffing perspective yep. um, are, are concerning and I, I, don't, I don't think our community wants to see that, that ha happen. It's not really an option. So. And so as we get to those levels, just as we do with fires where we do set up shelters and medical sheltering, and I can have emergency preparedness talk about this, we're going to be establishing places for people to be quarantined. Okay. The ill, uh, we're already have places established for the ill who are actually positive for COVID-19. Uh, and then those that are just sick with, there's a number of respiratory and other colds and, and uh, illnesses going around the community right now that are actually circulating around the community. Uh, and so we can discuss those. And then as far as obtaining uh, more goods, I'd like to uh, have been addressed that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And did you want to? Yeah. yeah, you sure can. Thank you. So thank you for the question, really appreciate it. Um, so at, you're correct, it's really difficult to get some of those supplies right now, even just going to the store, um, getting even small quantities of them. The county has experienced that as well. In terms of hand sanitizer, what the county ended up doing, um, we do have some supplies coming if they were on back order, but what we ended up doing is we're making our own. Um, which many places are doing. So one of the things that we can explore is perhaps how we can partner and uh, produce more and make those for organizations such as yourself. Great. So, yeah, absolutely. So we'll get more information on that. And then, uh, well, I just wanted to, so everybody could hear, uh, the question was Flagstaff Shelter Services and how uh, they can protect themselves uh, with a population like that uh, with, between illness and the, and the quarantine and the isolation piece. And then there's also a question about obtaining supplies and I'm going to let uh, uh, Ben uh, address that. Uh, I'd be the first thing I would say is that there's not a great solution. We don't have a you know just a, a giant cash to you know open up and say hey everybody come get it. So it really I know the state right now we're kind of following the state's guidelines. They're developing a one the resources they have what they call mass cash supplies uh, that are basically pallets of, uh, of, of assets that are kind of on, in a warehouse. Uh, we have some of those locally, but those are, you know, they're, they're pretty limited in scope. Uh, so now the ADHS is working on developing a formulary to talk about, okay, let's earmark this for this county, this county, or that county, and then let's talk about a formulary of need. Uh, because different organizations, you know, are going to need things more than other organizations. Uh, so again, there's, it's a process of identifying what people need. Um, and what is the priority for that need and trying to get the right resources to the people as necessary. So I would say, honestly, if, 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 if this kind of expands, the, the only solution for resource management is communication. You're going to have to reach out to us and we're going to have to talk and we're going to have to, you know, like I said, all those circumstances uh, are going to vary depending on your circumstance and the priority for that, uh, that need. And then we'll do everything we can. I mean, we do have limited resources. Uh, but we do have some, you know, and so does the state, and so do the feds. Uh, so it depends on the scale of the uh, incident as well. Does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah, back here. Um, yeah, my name is Garrett. I'm with the TCA traffic. And I just wanted to know what are your recommendations for responders, police, fire, particularly where considered the, one of the largest community outside of Rice Bath. So we are trying to protect our limited first responders, police, and particularly our Department of Correctional Officers. So is there any recommendations such as PPE or anything like that? What are you guys doing here at you know, for your first responders? Great, yeah, thank you for that question. The question is about uh, protecting first responders. Uh, and thank you, first responders, uh, for being on the front lines, first, first of all. Uh, first and foremost, uh, oh, definitely being out in the community and uh, responding to calls uh, on those front lines uh, puts you at at most risk. And uh, so, thank you for thank you for being here and asking that question. Uh, for first responders, recommendations are are very similar for what we're recommending for healthcare providers. As you show up to a call, 
uh, and somebody is experiencing respiratory symptoms, you put, a, you put the surgical mask on that person. At this moment, surgical masks are only being recommended for those that are sick because it's gonna prevent those respiratory droplets from uh, getting out and contaminating some, or uh, uh, infecting somebody. Uh, and then as well for that is the recommendation is for uh, providers or first responders uh, that are responding to calls. In that short period of time where, where we're with somebody, those surgical masks are seen to work. They are not recommended to be used by the general public because they're not gonna prevent you from the, the illness in, a, in over a longer period of time. Uh, so first off, a, a respiratory illness, uh, masking that person, putting a mask uh, on yourself uh, during that transport. And then uh, formulating some questions to assess the risk of this person for COVID-19. Those risks are related to symptoms. Do they have a fever? Do they have respiratory symptoms of cough or difficulty breathing? Now those symptoms do not distinguish themselves from other illnesses at all. Altitude sickness could cause that, honestly. And so uh, symptoms alone are not going to uh, uh, dictate uh, the need for COVID-19 testing, but asking those questions about their travel. Where have they been in the last two weeks? What have they been up to? Have they traveled to an area with widespread transmission? Have they potentially come in contact with somebody who has been, a confer who's been confirmed for COVID-19? This is what our first responders can do during that transport time. Protecting respiratory droplets uh, from getting out from the patient, protecting yourself using those masks, and then identifying the risk for COVID-19. And these are techniques that we can use for any respiratory illness, even those with more severe and worse symptoms than COVID-19. Does that help answer your question, give you advice? Yes. Or was does. there some follow-up? Um, because like I said, we're very limited on our staff with police. Yes. And yeah. we police a very large area of yeah. um, that information. So these are recommendations I'm in trying to put in place for our police. Great. Yeah. And then to follow up with that, awesome resources on both the CDC and state website. You go to your particular area, EMS, uh, and first responders, and uh, it gives great descriptions, uh, more detailed than what I'm able to talk about right now. Okay. Thank you. Hey. Matt, if I could add, I, yeah. we're developing flow charts based on the Great. CDC recommendations with Honor Health, so I can provide these to, Great. to you guys, and then that, so that that way the EMS providers in the field kind of can walk down that. Yeah. And since they're used to doing that anyway. Yeah, uh, Dibbler and those uh, those flow charts are perfect, and enhancing that triage of, of risk is super important. Thank you. Yes. Phil Chesham, uh, Sedona City Council, speaking for myself. Um, you mentioned uh, transmission state being low now. It sounds like transmission state is a trigger for escalating activities. So is it low, medium, high? And if it is that, can you, can you give the 30-second elevator speech on what makes you guys change from low to medium, or from medium to high? Just so I can kind of frame how big it's got to get before we get to the next level. Great, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I don't know if, I'll, I'll let Ben touch on that low, medium, high aspect, but what I will say with us being such a large county, land-wise, that there may be areas that are deemed more high risk. So let's say we get a, a, a confirmed case within a school and we're gonna do our contact investigation. The investigation we go through is we ask a series of questions to figure out where is this person gone and who have they come in contact with and we identify the, the most high risk exposures. And uh, along with that, the number of cases that we're seeing will start to uh, elevate that response as far as closures and uh, school closures, the social distancing, the isolation, the quarantining aspects, and that may happen in one area and not another area. And you might tag that area as a medium at that point? And, and I'll let him address uh, uh, that part. Uh, but then once we start to see where we've identified that throughout our community, uh, we are seeing uh, community spread, community transmission, so a lot of uh, aspects around the case are gonna be important. Did that person travel? Did they pick it up from traveling somewhere? Did they come in contact while traveling with a known confirmed case? Or are we seeing transmission around the community? And that's gonna, that's gonna really dictate uh, our levels of, of response. Did you guys make that call? Your, your, your team is going down there yes. doing that? Yes, our, our incident command team is gonna make and that Sedona, call. Is it Yelpai County and you guys are working together or? Yeah, exactly. So Yavapai County, uh, Coconino County, and really the state of Arizona 
is assisting make that call. And as we get cases, we've seen CDC assistance within these areas. So California, Washington, uh, and New York all have CDC assistance to help make that call right now. So it's not gonna, it's gonna be a county thing. It's gonna be a, a, a nationwide collaboration to uh, determine uh, level of risk. Thank you. And I'll just uh, address your question like this. As I mentioned before about triggers, um, every community is a little different uh, from everything from geography to population density to vulnerable populations. Um, so again, it goes back to there's no there's no clear uh, trigger. So uh, really what it is is we need to have that communication. Uh, so the incident command team is there to help have that uh, conversation. We pull in uh, our own team, our own staff of professionals, but we also work with emergency management, ADHS, and whoever else needs to be involved to make that decision. And so it's really gonna be a, you know, if it gets, and one of the things I would mention is that we're, we're identifying there's, it, when this kind of t transmission occurs, typically occurs in clusters. Um, so therefore, if it happens somewhere, uh, we can address the circumstances at, for that specific cluster initially, um, and then of course evolve that, that guidance as necessary. Uh, does that help? Does that, I think so. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. that's good, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And, that, and then just to follow up, even with what we're seeing in those states uh, with greater transmission, it's, it's really certain counties uh, and certain areas within those counties that we're seeing that transmission and they are at, at this point uh, not elevating those risks for community transmission, even when we see a case uh, in a state of 140. <clears throat> so it's very dependent upon the circumstances and the situation. But we will be in contact uh, to let everybody know uh, that level of risk. Thank you. Matt, I have two questions. The first one, I read a study about the, the r naught on the Diamond Princess and it looked like it was pretty close to influenza. Is that, have you seen anything different than that? Yeah, so uh, R0, uh, let me, let me, so hey, a question about the R0. R0 is an uh, epidemiology term uh, that describes uh, an infected person, how many people they can infect. Uh, and the R0 for this, uh, I believe is still around uh, three to four is what, is, what they, is what we've seen in the, in the research. Cruise ships, they are uh, <laughs> a petri dish, they are not, uh, really what we can utilize is good science behind an R not for this because they're not normal circumstances within a community. It's a cruise ship where people are just all hanging out together. So an R not that we see within a cruise ship is not going to be uh, the, the, the good science behind an R not that we're going to see within community transmission. Uh, flu is less than that. However, flu has vaccination, flu has treatment, we do medical treatment. We do not have vaccines for this. We do not have uh, uh, medical treatment. Uh, the R not uh, in comparison at, at uh, three to four is ultimately fairly low for not having any of those uh, vaccines or any or or, um, or medical treatments associated with that. So, uh, but the research is still being done to identify just how many people one person can infect. And once again, let me let me uh, uh, say again that uh, those respiratory droplets are what we're seeing as the main contact. So those that are uh, becoming sick from a, 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 those exposed individuals that are becoming sick with COVID-19 from a confirmed case have really been those that have been very close contact for an extended period of time. Anyway, my second question was that, um, you know, I saw a couple studies that talked about temperature and humidity, how they impacted um, influenza transmission. So uh, at the fire station specifically, I was wondering if there, if you'd seen anything that just kind of showed that we can alter that environment within the station to reduce the potential for us to get you on scene. Uh, yeah, I don't have any recommendations for that at this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you all have a timeline? Sorry, Brie Barrios, Health Service, Arizona. Do you all have a timeline for when the Joint Information Center uh, will open if you're going to open it? Timeline for Joint Information Center. Did uh, Eric, did you want to address that? Good morning, everyone. I'm Trish Lees. I oversee communications for Health and Human Services. And I am going to ask Eric Peterson to join me up here because he has some of the answers to that question. He knew I would do that. <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about triggers this morning, and those will vary. We are in the process of planning our Joint Information Center, and we are ready to activate that. 
I'm going to let er um, Eric address a little bit of what those triggers might be moving forward. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to speak about two uh, different pieces that are often in the emergency management world and part of one, both the JIC and the Joint Information Center, the work of our PIOs, uh, both to uh, disseminate uh, public information, but then also to uh, assist the media and our community partners in answering questions as you may have, and also our call center. Let me start with the call center. Uh, we are prepared uh, with our experience in the museum fire to be able to stand that up. I've been working with our technology group uh, to be able to have the call center uh, prepared at a moment's notice. Um, so right now, uh, just so everyone knows, uh, if the public is calling, they are dealing with the HHS uh, staff here uh, at the department. Uh, that call center will be much the same. We'll probably have a short call handler called Tree at the front end of the call center, but then into real live people. But trying to help people with a real medical situation get to people that can answer that, but then also have the deployment of county staff to help uh, answer questions that may be more community in nature and, and, and those kinds of things. So uh, as to implementation of that and then the JIC, uh, that is a, a conversation that after this meeting our incident command team will be talking about along with our policy leaders about when do we do that. Um, uh, those are important triggers that we have to talk about. Uh, certainly if we have a positive case there will be an activation of all those resources. The policy conversation we're having is should we activate some of those resources prior to a case? Because it is not a when, an if we have a case, it's a when we have a case. And so the matter of how we begin our information efforts and expanding it from just, uh, not just, but a, a, a very well-organized department response to really a one-county response to how we are engaging the community and disseminating information will be important. So that's a policy conversation that will be had today. Um, I would expect that as you have seen news uh, start to rise and we have, our inquiries have gone up that we will likely see some of those triggers come sooner rather than later. Uh, and so in a conversation that I've had with a few of you, if we're going to, uh, if a policy team decision is to truly operate a JIC under the status that it would normally be in an emergency operations center, many of your partner, you as partners will be asked to participate in that to help ensure that we can do all the operations of that kind of a joint information center in the right way uh, and really understand and help to address fears and concerns that the public may have. Uh, just to give you a quick sense, um, this is public information. Supervisor Parks uh, has isolated himself. I think you all have seen those stories, uh, just simply due to his connection uh, with Representative Gosar. So, a self isolation um, that has caused some really great social media chatter, right? And real, uh, really outlandish questions. That is what a JIC helps to answer, right? We data mine, we look at what people are saying and help to answer the questions and knock down rumors. So that is our goal, that is our plan. Uh, I don't have a specific activation time for you, but that is a policy conversation that will be had today uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get into daily briefings to the public at some point about this uh, and, and really addressing those concerns and fears as they go forward. Thank you, Eric. Did that address the question? Um, let me Okay. okay. Richard Knapp from uh, Flagstaff Medical Center. Just if we can encourage you to stand up at least the call center somewhat soon. You know, our staff on um, our red line call center at PBX are getting a substantial number of calls from people who are increasingly frustrated about um, the answers that we provide, which is basically look at ADHS and county sure. for information. Um, so that's, at some point, it's going to be really useful. Appreciate the input. Our call center uh, right now, um, I'm going to save the call handler technology piece, but we can stand it up within an hour. So once a decision is made, uh, we can make that kind of work happen. So. Where would that be? So uh, as of right now, plans are that the call center will be in this building um, and in an area uh, that we're not going to release to the public so we don't get re <laughs> inundated. Uh, it is likely, I will caveat likely, so that the policy team may make a change that the JIC would be in this building as well. So we can utilize the resources of staff uh, that are, are trained in this area as we have to answer questions. And Matt would like to clarify one of those points, but I did want to bring up there's been a lot of talk about contacting us, and we are going to email this group with contact information because you might be wondering, who do I talk to? So following this meeting, there will be a follow-up email with that information. Thank you. Yeah, just a, a quick, call, uh, quick clarification on uh, the terms and the language that, that uh, is being used. 
Uh, isolation is for ill, so those experiencing symptoms is isolation. Quarantine is for those who are potentially exposed and not experiencing symptoms. Social distancing is for those people who uh, have, it, have, an, have an illness or a highly uh, susceptible population, uh, an illness that we do not believe to be COVID-19, and we're asking them to socially distance themselves, or since they are sick, self-isolate the ill and quarantine for those that could potentially be exposed. All right, Bill again, can you clarify the uh, vulnerable population preparedness position you're making? Great, yeah, the vulnerable population yes. that we're talking about uh, for COVID-19 has been seen to be those that are 60 and older. And what do you want them to do? And for those individuals, uh, the recommendations right now are for social distancing to take place like and, today, and, per and, and prepare themselves uh, for the chance for widespread transmission. Like start doing that now, not wait till another trigger is reached. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Right now, the CDC uh, guidance is, is telling them to stay away from large areas, so events or cruises, things like that. Uh, but uh, uh, the recommendation is not saying to stay away from a grocery store or anything like that. However, large events and cruise ships is the exact communication behind that. So March 29th, which is, uh, what, uh, 18 days away, is uh, Welcome Home Vietnam Vets. we got a lot of those. They're all over 60, most of them. I think they're all over 60. Should I be covering uh, we're gonna, I'm going to encourage you to contact uh, your event coordinator okay. to contact uh, uh, Health and Human Services, and we can discuss the parameters behind okay. uh, that situation. Thanks. I'm Rick Hansinger with Williams School District. I am uh, sitting between Flagstaff and the Parks Representatives Districts also. We are all going to be going on spring break here this next week. Uh, we are hoping to make it to that point without any cases. It looks like right now, but we know that when kids go spring break and they go to Disneyland and wherever else and come back, we're going to have to be on alert when we come back. Can you tell me a little bit more about kids? Uh, are they showing symptoms? You know, are they are they carrying the virus without having symptoms? Is there a certain symptom they show first? Should we be checking the temperatures of a lot more kids than we're doing right now? I can tell you that if you come to my school, and I imagine this be any school, especially this K through three schools, there are sick kids in school right now. If you were to walk into them, uh, there's running noses, there's coughing going on. Uh, it's, it's just a regular at this time of year. Should we be really adamant about when we come back about sending those kids back home? Okay, so let me let me first address the spring break concerns. The messaging right now surrounding spring break. Uh, should be advising people to limit limit their travel, uh, especially to areas where we're seeing widespread transmission, uh, to areas where we're not seeing any transmission. Uh, I can't give you a guarantee that they're not going to get it uh, anywhere they go, uh, but there is lower risk in certain areas of this country. Uh, and then globally, uh, they should definitely avoid areas where we're seeing widespread community transmission. Um, regarding symptoms, uh, regarding kids in general and the symptoms and the potential for them to be uh, carried. So the kids that uh, right now, uh, kids are being seen to not develop as severe symptoms uh, and uh, have some of those extreme symptoms associated with the cases. Uh, there has been some evidence of them, of kids being carriers uh, and infecting people, but uh, there is not any hard evidence behind that. So that research is still being done. So I don't have a good answer for you on that. We're gonna keep uh, updated as far as that goes. Uh, as far as you taking temperatures, uh, currently the, our recommendation is that schools are not doing those type of, of health screenings uh, or any organization doing those type of health screenings. That should be happening between the, a person and their health care professional, whoever that might be. Uh, Regarding uh, sick kids, uh, once again, there are lots of uh, respiratory illnesses and non-respiratory illnesses circulating around that are, that are real lots of flu still that are circulating around. And, and by and large, most people who are sick are sick with something other than COVID-19. However, since this illness does not have distinguishable symptoms and we are in the midst of an outbreak, we are advising <coughs> social distancing for anybody who is ill until those symptoms resolve. And so we need to be diligent about not having sick people going out into the community. 
Was there another question in there that I might have missed? Is there a symptom that shows up first? Is there a symptom that shows up first? Do I have any uh, healthcare professionals in the room that want to address that? <coughs> Dr. Abbott, I see you smiling back there. <laughs> Exactly. I know that, I know based on, you know, a Twitter account of one physician who's <laughs> okay. currently sick and in self-isolation, his first symptom was fever, headache, and sore throat, and then a cough on day three, and then a fever on day three, and then he started developing his personal fusion on day four. Great. So, uh, there is no evidence of a symptom showing up first. Uh, we've even seen in some of the cases that uh, they may not have the fever or they may not have the, the respiratory symptoms. And so with that, there is not evidence of a symptom showing up. Thank you. Richard F. from FMC. Any guidance on whether ADHS is going to st um, be able to stand up weekend announcements for results? Uh, that I have not heard yet. We're in, we're in contact with them uh, every day. Uh, and so uh, asking them about, I think they're going to be waiting until we see more uh, transmission to do weekend testing. Right now the lab at, at the state uh, is not open on the weekends. And so they are uh, continually evaluating the need for that and then the need for updates over the weekend as well. Dr. Is, is now that commercial testing is available, um, until, the question I have for you is should we still go through you for testing until there's widespread cases? Yes, so the, in answer to that, uh, yes, contact us with any potential case, healthcare uh, facilities, contact Coconino County Health and Human Services with any PUI. Uh, and with that, we will discuss if they meet the criteria for sending to the state lab or if they don't, then the, the necessity is set to send to a commercial lab. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica Jay. I work at North Country Healthcare. Just a quick question. Yes. Do you have a rate of death for those who are infected? Uh, we don't uh, currently have a, a super accurate one. Uh, what we've seen uh, out of Wuhan, the, the World Health Organization had a team go into to Wuhan and Hubei and China in general, and uh, they did estimate within Wuhan a, a 2 to 4% uh, fatality rate. But uh, the rest of the world is seeing below one uh, of about 0.7% fatality rate. But that number, we don't have a clear idea of the denominator. We don't have a clear idea of the total number of people that are sick because right now we are only identifying the most severe cases. So those that are getting it and we're not testing and not seeing uh, are not included in those numbers. So we do not have an accurate number as, the, as far as the fatality rate behind COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, Enjoy. Just want to be very respectful of everybody's time. We're at 9:30. Uh, I do want to see if Supervisor Babbitt wants to say anything real quick. You all set? You all set? I appreciate uh, everyone being here. Thanks on behalf of the board. Really, thanks for your uh, interest. Awesome questions about engagement. Thank you. Uh, so, in closing, I want to uh, on your table these note cards. If you had a question uh, that didn't get answered uh, verbally, just write your question down put your contact information on it and drop it off over here at this table on your way out and we will follow up with you um, uh, by the end of the day or tomorrow at the latest. Uh, just in closing, I want to just say one thing about our team. Uh, the, uh, the team here that has been working really hard, uh, they have been an awesome, uh, an awesome group. They have worked uh, countless hours of getting uh, this information together as we've been going through this process and I couldn't ask for a better team to go through uh, this uh, crisis with. So thank you so much. I also want to say that we have great support from our community managers or our county manager's office and also from the Board of Supervisors. So thank you all for coming and uh, we will be in touch. Thank you. Thank you for doing it.